voice recorder from American Airlines Flight Hello, 77. This, this? Apparently does not have anything useful in terms of this investigation. Uh, I talked to some sources this morning who told me that the box was so badly damaged by uh, the fire and by the impact that they literally in the lab at the NTSB couldn't even get it open to attempt to retrieve the data. The fear is even if it eventually is open, even if they can reconstruct somehow the tape that's been shattered, that they will have very, very little, if anything, to go on. This is a big blow to the investigation in the sense that investigators were trying to find out more about what was going on in the cockpits. What did the terrorists uh, talk about? Were there communications from the pilots? Uh, just kind of the mindset as that plane closed in on the Pentagon. Now, the other black box from the Pentagon does have data. That's the flight data recorder. It's not of much interest to the investigation because we already know what happened with the airplane. It could clear up that one question about whether or not the plane circled through Washington and seemingly selected a target. And that could be cleared up at some point when they read it. Uh, finally, about the Pennsylvania crash, uh, also one box there has been recovered, the flight data recorder. That will be read out later, I'm told. But missing in that is the cockpit voice recorder. It may be the only remaining chance that investigators have to find out uh, firsthand from tape recordings what was going on in the air as this attack unfolded on Tuesday. And Dan, just very quickly about airlines. The system, again, is staggering to get back to some semblance of normalcy. But this morning across America, we saw huge lines, crushing delays. And at this hour, some airports, including Boston's Logan, and Washington's Reagan National remain closed and may be closed for some time. Dan? Bob Orr. We go to the Pentagon and David Martin. David? Dan, the uh, Defense Department and FBI are investigating the possibility that uh, two Ooh. of those hijackers may actually have attended U.S. military schools. Two of the names on that list are the same as the names of two men from Middle Eastern Air Forces who attended the Defense Language Institute at Lackland Air Force Base in Texas and the Air War College at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. Now, at neither of those schools would they have learned how to fly. All they would have gotten was uh, basic proficiency in English and exposure to basic uh, Air Force doctrine, but it certainly would be a, a a cruel irony if, if it were confirmed, and I must stress it is not confirmed. The names are the same, but it is not confirmed. Uh, if, in fact, uh, two of these hijackers uh, uh, learned uh, English at uh, U.S. Air Force schools. One other thing, Dan, I think we know a lot more now about what the U.S. is planning, because if you look at the complete list of what the U.S. has requested of Pakistan, uh, you can see that this is a, a major operation in, in the works for going after Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. Uh, they, they have not asked not just for overflight rights. They've asked for landing rights. They've asked for access to air bases. They've asked for access to naval ports and the ability to station military intelligence personnel in Pakistan. So if in fact, this operation goes forward, and if, in fact, the Pakistanis approve those requests, which they have not yet, uh, Pakistan would be a major staging ground for uh, what promises to be some major strikes into Afghanistan. Dan? David, uh, very quickly, I want to make sure I understand, and quite rightly, you said, look, we don't have this totally nailed down, we don't have three sources on it yet, but there are indications that at least two of the hijackers in the planes in addition to having been trained to fly in this country, perhaps, were trained by the U.S. military? That's right, but the, the, what we have to make clear is that what is for sure is that the names are the same. The names of the hijackers match the names of two people who attended these, these uh, two schools. Uh, but what has not yet been run to ground is whether, in fact, those people with the same names are, in fact, the same individuals understand and we wanted complete clarity on that and just a cautionary note we've learned over the last few days been reminded of one of the sort of rules of journalism beware early information because what you hear first what may appear to be true later frequently turns out to be untrue but this is certainly an interesting development to pursue the possibility that two of the hijackers are actually trained by the u.s. military at least 
in language skills. Now, no one, so far as I know, uh, in officialdom has uh, said so publicly, but it's clear that some of the hijackers uh, had as their country of national origin Egypt, and some had Saudi Arabia. Uh, perhaps I should say it, is, it appears that way. That isn't to say that uh, countries of national origin or some of the others were, were not other countries, but the line is leading uh, back to Egypt and back to Saudi Arabia in terms of identifying uh, these men, these killers, as to uh, from where did they come to the United States. Ed Bradley? Well, Dan, here's an interesting difference, if in fact this is true about Lackland Air Force Base. Another indication of the difference between these terrorists and the ones who were implicated in the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. In that case, those men worked in secret cells and in a sense lived underground. The terrorists this time made no attempt to hide. They hid in the open. In fact, they seemed to go out of their way, although some said they kept to themselves, to live openly in the communities in which they were residing, in Florida and Arizona, uh, and in some cases, New Jersey. They weren't trying to live underground. They were trying to go unnoticed by being open in their communities. Ed Brad, let's go to John Roberts at the White House. John? Uh, Dan, Marine One just landed here at the White House. You may be able to hear it spooling down behind me. The president uh, is uh, headed off to New York this afternoon uh, to get a first-hand look at the damage there. Uh, he'll tour the scene, talk with some of the rescue workers on hand. Uh, it's likely that he may also uh, visit a hospital and then meet with uh, New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani and the governor of New York State, uh, George Pataki. Although, I have to tell you, Dan, they're really keeping his schedule under wraps, which is uncharacteristic for the White House, but of course not unusual in a circumstance like this. The security cordon around the White House itself has now been extended out 12 blocks. And during the uh, ceremony at the National Cathedral, Dan, we heard uh, jet fighters flying combat air patrol over the Washington, D.C. area. That's one of the reasons why the president authorized a partial call-up of reserves, 13,000 of which will be coming from the U.S. Air Force. That's to fly combat air patrol in the corridor between Washington, D.C. and New York City. And, Dan, that looks like it's a, it's a process that's going to go on indefinitely. And part of the reason why uh, the president went to Congress to ask for a $20 billion appropriation in emergency funds. Congress offered to double that and, in fact, uh, has approved that in the Senate and is likely to do so in the House. Uh, the voting uh, was uh, suspended because of a problem with the machine. Uh, they then had to go off to the National Cathedral, but they'll get right back to it uh, just as soon as they get back to the Capitol building. Uh, from the president today at the uh, National Cathedral, uh, some words of comfort for a nation in what the president termed our middle hour of grief and also words of warning not just for the terrorists involved here, Dan, but also for the nation to say this is a long process and this is one that is going to be not only the focus of his administration, but one that could take this country on a war footing for a number of years. The president saying the responsibility to history is already clear to answer these attacks and rid the world of their evil. We are a peace, uh, peaceful nation, but fierce when stirred to anger. Yesterday, we, uh, we had about a 45-minute briefing with a senior administration official familiar with all of the machinations and uh, combinations and permutations of what's going on and what could possibly happen. Uh, that administration official said to us, Dan, that it's probably good to think about this in terms of years. Back to you. John, uh, a couple of questions. First, since this is America's new war, what President Bush called the first world war of the 21st century, the war against terrorism, has there been any talk at the White House of asking for sacrifice for all Americans. One of the lessons we thought we learned out of the Vietnam War, and which we put into effect in the Gulf War, if we're going to war, you go all in. There's no such thing as, you know, halfway or quarter of the way. And when President Roosevelt spoke to the nation after the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor in 1941, he made it clear that it the, the war effort was going to require sacrifice from every American. It wasn't just, well, our military is going to wage it. Has there been any talk or any sense of that around the White House? I, I haven't felt it. I haven't heard it myself, but you're there. Well, I was just about to say, Dan, that we, we haven't heard that direct language yet, but certainly they seem to be laying the foundation for that. Uh, the uh, administration official that we uh, had a briefing with yesterday said this is not going to be a single-pronged, one-time attack. This is going to be multi-pronged. It is going to be a, a multi-level attack. And again, the sustained nature of this. So, Dan, at the very least, 
they are laying the groundwork to the American people to say, this is going to take our country through a, down a long road, and, it, and it's a road uh, that is going to uh, absolutely consume this uh, administration and this nation. Uh, this idea of everyone may have to be prepared to sacrifice may be the next step along that road. Uh, you're looking at uh, Air Force One here, uh, spooling up now on the south lawn of the White House, the Washington Monument in the background. Uh, uh, sorry, Marine One. Uh, I said Air Force One. My, my, my mistake. Uh, Air Force One, of course, is a U.S. Air Force plane. Uh, this is a Marine helicopter. Uh, the president will be uh, leaving, uh, most likely, for Andrews Air Force Base, where he will take off uh, for New York. Uh, typically, the president would land at uh, at Kennedy Airport and then uh, go into the Wall Street heliport uh, via helicopter. Uh, we're told that uh, he's not going to be landing at uh, JFK. He's going to be going to an undisclosed location and then making his way into New York from there. In fact, and uh, we, we are hearing now that uh, the noise of the helicopter there. Uh, the, the White House has been uh, fairly open for the last few days about the specific locations of its officials. Uh, it will uh, no longer do so. Uh, there has been reams and reams of intelligence information coming in from around the globe. I'm sure you can imagine that no intelligence agency wants to be accused of hanging on to something that could be pertinent uh, to this investigation or pertinent to any uh, current threat, uh, either against the president or, or other sections of the government so there's all of this coming in crossing investigators desks Dan and, and the real word here is uh, d you know take all necessary precautions because there is a sense that perhaps this isn't over just yet well and that's where it, worth reminding ourselves that Vice President Dick Cheney, so far as can be determined, he's still at uh, Camp David in Maryland, is he not, John? Well, Dan, at this point, uh, they're not saying. Uh, they told us uh, yesterday afternoon that uh, he went from spending nights at Camp David and working here at the White House during the day to staying at Camp David until the weekend. The only thing we know about the Vice President's whereabouts, Dan, is where he was not, and that is that he was not at the National Cathedral for that National Prayer Service. Ed Bradley? Well, question you asked John about what the vocabulary they're using and what President Roosevelt said. The term they're using at the Pentagon is homeland defense and calling up military reservists. Did I really say being Air called Force? up to provide port operations, medical support, engineer support, generic civic support, and homeland defense, which is a term that harkens back to the Second World War. Let's go to downtown Manhattan, watching the recovery operation of CBS News correspondent John Frankel. John, the weather turned bad today with heavy rain. As we think about the, the president now on his trip to New York City, the question is, how has the rain affected the rescue and recovery operations? Well, Dan, it has really hampered the operations, although except for stopping briefly at noon for a moment of silence, the search and rescue teams, the firefighters, and the other workers who have volunteered here have continued to go on. We want to show you some tape from earlier this morning that shows them keeping at it. They are going bit by bit, piece by piece, to take out the debris. They are using big machines, little hands. They have lined up in columns. They use little shovels. They take off pieces of debris. They sift through it. They put it in buckets. That's loaded on the dump trucks that we've heard about and are moved out. The rain certainly hampered those efforts today. Uh, lightning did as well through the course of the evening. It has stopped raining right now, although it is expected to continue to be a light drizzle through most of the afternoon. But the footing is slippery, lots of mud, and that is making it difficult at ground zero. It is a daunting task when you see it up close, and quite frankly, a very tedious process. But as we said, lots and lots of firefighters and rescue workers as they change shifts constantly through the day, continuing to get to ground zero and changing out and continuing on in this process. As, as people at memorial services around the country sing of pride and glory, these search and rescue teams continue to work in concert, hoping for signs of light. But I can tell you that just a few minutes ago, we did see a truck drive by, posted on the side. It said, Bellevue Morgue. Dan? John Frankel, as the nation's airline system and air transport system as a whole struggles to get back to some sense of normalcy. Look, it's never going to be what it was before, but at least some level of normalcy. Let's check in with Mark Strassman at uh, Atlanta's Hartsfield Airport. Mark? 
Uh, Dan, that sense of normalcy, of course, is what everyone wants, especially uh, the flying public. And from talking to a number of folks inside the terminal here today, I can tell you that there is a good deal of anxiety. The fear factor of flying again, to be sure. But the real worry today is more practical. It's simply finding a plane that will actually lift off. Only about 40% of scheduled flights here in Atlanta are taking off today, and they are taking off from a very changed airport. The relative serenity that you see behind me ends the moment you step in the terminal. A uh, ticket with the day's date. I need a ticket with the day's right. date. Atlanta's air travelers today have a date with Bedlam. Where you going? To Orlando. Destination somewhere up ahead, the ticket counter, with a detour to confusion. Right around to the right, young lady. And delay. We've been in line now about you know, an hour, and we've still got a long way to go, so. A long way to go. A long way to go. Lines were hundreds deep. With curbside check-in gone, the bottleneck, predictably, was at the ticket counters. Our flight is leaving at 10.20, and we thought we'd come in early at 7, 7 o'clock, and it was not too early. <laughs> Just barely going to make it, I think. As they stood and read the latest on what explains all this, many of the frustrated said they know air travel has to change, but not into this. But we got to figure out something better than this. This is not going to work. <laughs> the system's not working. It really isn't. It's just, I mean, I, I know they have to do something, but they have to figure something else out. Like the people in this shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder terminal, this is a system struggling to find its way again. So about twice as many airplanes taking off today than took off yesterday. The fact that New York City's three major airports are back open again, that, of course, will help here, although those airports are flying only on a very limited schedule. By this weekend, Atlanta's airport, the world's busiest airport, hopes to be flying at about 70% capacity. And by then, perhaps, some of the folks in this terminal today may actually have the chance to get wherever it is they want to go. Dan? Mark Schlossman in Atlanta. In Los Angeles at the Los Angeles International Airport is CBS's Sandra Hughes. Sandra? Dan, all but a handful of the nation's airports have reopened today. Less than 30 of the nation's 451 airports are closed. Now, planes started crisscrossing the country this morning as the air traffic system just sort of tried to inch its way back to some normalcy and try to catch up to the regular schedule. Here in Los Angeles, as Mark was saying, it's just the same as it was down in Atlanta. Lines are snaking outside of the terminals as people line up trying to uh, catch canceled flights, trying to catch flights that were scheduled today, get to where they're going. But you know what I noticed the most here in Los Angeles as I walked up and down talking to the folks in those lines is just this amazing sense of patience.